How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Good. And also my brother is here and my niece, so. <laughs> it was a hot one outside yesterday, but for me to complain would be ridiculous because I moved to this state, so I knew what I was getting into when I, when I started coming this way. And if I have the mic drop, I'll just somebody just like point to the sky and I'll pick it back up to my mouth. I'm not used to having this one. Nate got me hooked on the hands-free after I'd said I'd never like it. All right, I'm going to pray. Jesus, let me get out my phone first. There we go, no distraction. Jesus, we worship you, we love you, and we thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here, and we thank you that we get to have this opportunity um, to, to speak about you, Jesus, and to um, just be in your presence and just get to be with church family and um, just really dig into the word and, and see what you have for us. So I just ask you, God, to bless this word. Um, I keep saying this, I'm just flesh, God. I just ask you to, to work through me. Um, we love you, we worship you, and I just keep feeling it, and, and we trust you. All right. So, um, as always, actually, you know what? I want to thank Walt, because, like, without Walt, we wouldn't have been, I wouldn't, like, we, nobody, everybody here was lost when we have these people gone. And Becky, I'm sorry. I should, I should actually, I should have thanked Becky first because she was she was up there and then called Walt down in. But Becky didn't need Walt. She was just being nice and let Walt figure it out. <laughs> and and uh, also, Becky is like like I said before, she's the the glue that holds this church together and uh, the emails and the texts and the the stuff you do for the youth and everything. Super super appreciate it. Thank you. So. We're missing quite a few people, right? So let's all text them and ask them where they're at. <laughs> Bring them a little bit, of, ask them if they actually tithed when they're gone, you know? <laughs> and if they didn't, give them the text to, text to send. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, it's just cool, uh, like when we have people, people missing, there's just people that step up and church still happens. So praise God for all of you guys. So in worship, Obviously, is where we start. Um, in that song, it says, when, when something says you're guilty, point to the empty cross. So has, has anybody done something where they've just felt uh, just guilty? And um, you've let this shame kind of come on you. Um, but God doesn't give you guilt, shame, and condemnation. So if you feel these things, they're not yours. And what does it say to do? It says to point to the empty cross. So that's what I'm going to do. I feel guilty? No, God, you didn't make me to feel guilty. Why do I feel guilty? Did I do something? Okay, turn my face. Okay, God, let's, let's do something different. The empty cross is why you don't feel guilty anymore. Praise God. Yeah. And then, um, no longer a slave. Brought back some <clears throat> really good memories because uh, my Allie Bear, she used to say, every day when I was a stay-at-home dad, she'd be like, Dad, can we listen to Slave Fear, Slave Fear, Slave Fear? It's like all I heard. It was ridiculous. It was like my kids asking to jump into the pool. So it brought back a lot of sweet memories of corporate family worship and how we used to, remember Cindy, we used to like, what was it, like twice, three times a week, just spend an hour like worshiping or something or 45 minutes. I don't remember what it was, but it was, it was, a, it was a really special time. And maybe it's because we were snowed in all the time in South Dakota. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe we just really, really loved Jesus and wanted to corporately go after him. We'll just call it like that. Um, but uh, how many of you guys struggle with fear? Like, have anybody had, like, fear creep up in their life, you know? Um, you know, like your, your family member and um, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay this bill? What happens? And you're, like, looking into the future and you can so easily let fear just grip a hold of you. <laughs> but we're no longer a slave to that fear. And why? Because I'm a child of God. He didn't make me to swim in that. He didn't make me to live in that. He says, it's okay. I got you. You don't have to fear. Why are you taking that on for yourself? It's not for you. And I'm just like, so grateful for the opportunity that when I feel, if I feel guilty, if I feel fear, he paid that price. I don't have to... I don't have to go and struggle and walk through the mud 
I just have to realize what he did. And I have to realize that I'm in that mud, step out, brush off my feet, and say, God, I've been going through the mud. Help me go the right direction. Help me seek your face. Help me continually to look to you when I have a struggle. I just could go on and on about worship. It's so good. Get some worship in your life, guys. And when you worship, look at the words that you're saying. You know, like, we have this, I, I guess I had this thing where I just, you know, I just, I know the words and I go through it and I go through it and I've heard this song a million times, but we have to make it special. We have to, because what are we doing? We're worshiping the king. He doesn't want us to come with the going through the motions. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. You're my God. Do you, do you feel it when you say it? They're not just words. We're declaring, I am no longer a slave. Why? Because I am a child of God. Just grasp it. I mean, it's just, just nuts how worship is and how we can just overlook just words, but they're not just words. We need to attach ourselves to them. We need to pour out ourselves. Like that song said, it goes running into the throne room. Do you feel that way when you go into worship? Do you feel that way when you go into your prayer time and your secret time with God? Or do you just kind of mosey on and shut the door? Are you running into that throne room because you can't wait to spend time with him? I want to be running. (laughs) I'm tired of walking. And God, help me realize when I am walking. Because I don't want to walk. I want to run. I want to be full of enthusiasm and joy for you. All right. So I want to something that's really funny. Um, Ashley, uh, one of our youth leaders, we were having a conversation, and um, she was talking about how she picked up a, a random person. Like the conversation went, "Hey, I like your hair," and it was like pink or something. And she was like, "Oh, cool." And then they got talking, and the lady was like, "Hey, I need a ride. Uh, just got out of got out of jail. Cops picked me up, whatever." And she's just sharing this nice, easy story. And I was like remembering a time when I would, I would do that kind of stuff and just be like, boom, 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 and go for it. And then I, I had mentioned to her, and I was like, man, I'm glad I never run into those things anymore. And wouldn't you know it, not even a couple days later, I'm driving down Old Drum out in the country, middle of nowhere, lady with pink hair on a bridge crying her eyes out. Like, what? I never God. <laughs> Um, and then another instance, me and Ashley were sharing, and um, I said, I would, I would, I'm glad that never happens to me. And then a week later, like something like we were discussing, um, kind of personal, so I don't want to share it, but happened. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. And then it really started to get me thinking. And then um, Ashley ran across a, a post on Facebook, and it said, don't ever tell God what you'll never do. He'll have you nevering like you never, ever, nevered before. <laughs> and I thought it was just like super funny how I can think that I can never and never and never and never. And he was like, who are you? What? <laughs> like, oh, that's cute, Jesse. And then another one was, um, I think I said last year that my family never comes and visits me. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and then um, I've had almost every single family member visit me this past year. Like, come on. That's so cool. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, God, I'll, man, I'll never be in an eight-bedroom house. <laughs> I'll never have 100 acres. How does that work? You know, there's a fine line there. There's power in your words, guys. There's power. So watch what you're nevering, okay? Because <laughs> God will have you nevering like you never, ever nevered before. That's so good. All right, let me get into my notes. So last time, uh, I was Matthew 6, and as I was thinking about what to go for today, I've just been still stuck in Matthew, and I say, why not go to Matthew 7, Uh, because it kind of ties into the message I gave last time, Um, and Matthew is, Matthew 7 to me, it's just like a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's like, um, it's stuff that we've heard and stuff that we've, like, it's not necessarily a super big mystery, and it's, I just like to go through the practical applications and how I think about it and how I perceive it, which I think is what God wants me to do. All right, so on Matthew 7, and by the way, who edits these on that live Facebook? One of you two? 
you guys do a really good job on that. Like I was, because like when I say it, I go like six one and six two, and you guys are just boom, you pop them up. It's it's very pleasing to watch, actually. So, all right. So seven. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard in which you will be judged. Woo! So it says, don't judge others, right? Okay. <laughs> is that easy? Have you, can you guys not judge others? You know what I mean? I mean, have you guys, is that something you guys have a super strong hold on where God said, don't judge them, so I'm not going to judge them. And I almost think like it, it feels better if God said it, it would be better for you if you couldn't judge them, you know. Um, but since you do, let me give you a little tip. The standard you use judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Woo! I, I, feel, I don't feel like I have to expound on that very much, but stop judging people, guys. Come on. <laughs> like, you will be judged in the manner that you judge. If you're looking at somebody, you turn your nose up, and I, they'll, they'll do that, all, whatever you can say about them. You will be judged, and you will be held to that same standard. So I know when I get to heaven... I would really like a light standard to be judged by. <laughs> I'm just flesh, you know? God, have mercy on me. Help me when I, when I see somebody and I, I want to go to that critical spirit and I want to judge them, God. Help me slash that. Let that not be something that swims up in my heart. And then uh, number three is always fun. I think we've all... <laughs> I've been in this situation. I can definitely tell you I have. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, here, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't even see past the log in your own eye? Ooh. Number five, he says, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. All right. So like I said last week, these are red letters, Okay. Jesus just said, hypocrite with an exclamation point. Oh boy, I don't want to be in that category, right? And I think it's really funny that if you have a log in your eye, so like what this is saying, um, if somebody doesn't get it anywhere, um, if you see that your friend has a problem and you're like, here, let me help you with that problem, yet you have either the same problem or a bigger problem, like who are you to come alongside that person and try to you know, help them out of their stuff? Like work on you before you work on them. So it's, I think it's really funny that um, if we had a log in our eye, don't you think we would see it, right? We would be like, oh, there's something here and there. Um, but I think it's really cool that Jesus said, first get rid of the log in your own eye. So he's telling you, like, hey, you have something in your eye. Like, get it out. Because you can't see clearly if there's something obstructing your vision. So how can you see into the person's life to help them out if you can't even get past your own stuff? Because this log is like your own selfish ambitions and your own, your own struggles that you have in your life. So like before you think that you want to come along and help somebody, get with God and see what help you need on your life. You know, because it's like um, in discipleship, you can only replicate what you are. You know, I can't, I can't be uh, deeply addicted to drugs and porn and go help somebody that's a, that's a sex addict and loves drugs. I mean, it's just we're not going to get that, to that point. So if I feel like I'm called to this or called to that and God's leading you there, say, God, do I have something in my eye that would stop me from helping these people? And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to say, God, show me. Your word says this, and I want to do this. Help me to make sure I don't have this. And then we, and then just ask God to show you the, the plank in your eye. Ask him to show you if you have that, you know, because sometimes, obviously, we're oblivious to having that if he has to point it out and say, hey, you have one of those. So, God, if we do, help us. And then number six, <clears throat> don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Has anybody had pigs before? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not really fun. I mean, we had pigs, and we moved here, and we had two, and they escaped so much, and Cindy was pregnant, and she couldn't handle roping them up, so I don't know, never mind. That was a 
Probably shouldn't share that story, huh, babe? Long story short, we couldn't handle the pigs, so we just butchered them on the spot. <laughs> Sorry, I said we. I was here. It's McQueen over there. She, uh, she does all the butchering of animals. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have to kill them, but we're good. Um, okay, so anyways, pigs, they're nasty. They rut. They, they always get out. And if you're not careful, they will turn and get you. And I like how he described that for pigs too. Um, so I've been in this position before and like not even like kind of realized it when like say you're talking to somebody that's like, like deeply religious and um, like an example, I was trying to talk about healing with somebody and somebody was like, healing's not for today. And they were talking about like the gifts of the spirit and stuff like that. And we were just, and it was like a, it was like a decent friend or whatever. Like I, I just met um, a little bit ago and we were just, we were just having this banter back and forth and back and forth. And, um, next thing you know, it just turned ugly and it turned into arguing. And like, I don't argue about Jesus and the scriptures. Like I'll, I'll have a conversation with you, but I'm not going there with you. I won't. Why? Because you will stomp on him and you will attack me. That's what they're, that's what the devil wants to do is set you up for something like this so that they can attack you. So if, yeah, and I've I've actually encountered this a bunch when you're like trying to share a testimony with somebody and they're like, uh uh-huh, yeah, that's cool. Okay, which huh? God did what? Oh yeah, buddy, that's really cool. Praise God. Like, that sucks. You know what I mean? Like it's not somebody like you want in your life to like we want to share a testimony. It's to spur you on and to build you up and sometimes people just aren't on that level. So if you have like, you know, some people are on fire for God and like they've been living for the world and all of a sudden they get on fire and they keep hanging around with their old friends but their old friends just don't get it. You know? Hey, you know what I read in the Bible? No, they don't really care either. I mean, it's good to testify but sometimes you're in a position to where you're feeding pearls to pigs. You know? So if, if you're in that position or you know somebody in that position, come alongside and help them and point it out and be like, hey. And, you know, it leads to a lot of frustration and bitterness, too. And that's why God said, you know, God wants you around people who edify and build you up. He doesn't want you around people who will just stomp on them pearls and attack you. And I've been stuck in that position where I've been with people that are just pigs and they just attack you. And um, you can explain it away and say, it's okay. They're my friends. You know, they don't mean that. They do. So if you're in a relationship like that, run. Run like you're running to the throne room. Run as far away as you can from it. There could be some restoration later. All right. So moving on to seven. I like, um, if you remember in six, uh, let's see, where was it? In six, it said, teaching about prayer and fasting. Um, and about six, five, we talked about it last time. And then I love how um, Jesus, he, he teaches you like, hey, if you don't know how to pray, you don't know how, don't know how to have connection, here's how you connect with the Father. And he says, you know, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Um, and he, he taught you like a template on how to pray and how to have a conversation with the Father. And then I love in seven how he follows it up with, okay, now there's prayer, now here's effective prayer. And he says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Persistence, right? Don't go to God just one time sometimes, you know? Like, uh, well, I asked him to help out with this and he didn't. So I guess we move on. Jeez, man, pursue the Lord. He's pursued you all your life. The, the, the best you can do is go after him. You can't go after him harder than he's gone after you, but you can sure try, and he'll bless it. What are you, what are you asking for? Jeez, knock on that door. What does that knocking on that door look like? It, it's a continually coming to him. I'm here again. I'm here to meet with you. It's like, oh man, so that's not even the way I say it. I'm here to meet with you, my lover, lover of my soul. Jehovah Jireh, Lord, my provider. Because when you, oh man, yeah, sorry. I'm gonna, I was going to go into it. Um, number nine, your parents. If your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask you for a fish, do you give them a snake? Dad, I'll never ask you for a fish. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? And I love this too, because when my kids ask me for something, I, I want to give it to them. I want to show them the world. I want to give them anything and everything they ask for. And unfortunately, that might lead to entitled kids. So we got to learn how to curb that, because I don't want to go through entitled kids. <laughs> That's just, it's just no fun. Um, but I think it's cool, because it says, even if you sinful people know how to good, give good gifts, <laughs> how much better is he at giving gifts He's, gonna, he's not going to give you, if you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. It's like um, when my daughter asks for like a bike and I give her a scooter or something like that. Like that's, It's not the way it's going to go. Um, God's going to give me what I'm asking for. And what I think it's really funny is if you keep on knocking on that door, it's a continually coming to him. And if you're continually coming to him, then he's going to place desires in your heart. And those are the things that you're going to truly want to go after. And he's already going to want to fulfill them for you. So he's, just, he's giving you a step by step. Like, seek me, knock, given. That's good. And then, you know, and... If you're continually seeking him, you're not going to be asking for something that he doesn't want you to have, you know? And me asking for a bigger house, he placed that in me. He said, he said try it. Ask me. Let's go for it. And um, I saw a house for sale. Beautiful. It was like everything I would like write down on the list, but I'm not in that position to buy it. But I say, God, I see you. Like he didn't just dangle that in front of my face. He said, see, in this market, there's stuff out there for you. So then it, it got me thinking, you know, okay, cool. So it just gave me hope, you know, because he, even though it didn't fulfill right now, it's like, oh, you can make a property like that for me. So I feel like I missed out on that property, God. No, I didn't, because if it was my property, I would be there. So thank you, God, that it's not ready yet. And I'm not just happy with my house at all, by the way. It's, it's definitely more than enough and beautiful, and I thank you, Jesus, for it. All right, and uh, number 12, I think we've all lived this one throughout our life. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Love God, love people. It gets me thinking like... um, like in my construction company, I have uh, subcontractors, and it would be really easy for me to pull up my truck, say, unload the mortar, and then watch them do it, right? Would I want somebody to do that to me? I mean, I know I'm paying these guys, and you know, there's, a, there's a something to be said about roles and positions, but that's just not the way I go. I want, I want my guys to see that I'm in it with them and that I'm in it working with them. I can, I can pick up those bags. I can unload those bags. I can pick up the debris. Um, and that, it, it's so good because you get treated well, you know? You treat them well, I get treated well. And especially in like a, a subcontractor, contractor area, you can, contractors can take advantage of subs like really easily. Um, and I think subs can take advantage of contractors very easily too so there's this relationship that god said and it's so easy the golden rule golden rule treat them how you want to be treated i want to be treated with respect i want to be treated with honesty so i'm going to give you the same thing and if i'm not getting the same thing then see you later you know or you can come alongside of them and love them and help them out in that situation which god will tell you when it's time it's easy guys isn't it? Love God, love people, treat people the way you want to be treated. And I like how um, the golden rule matches up to where he started. Um, for you, let me see, number two, for you will be treated as you treat others, the standard you used in judging is the standard you will be judged. And then he brings it back home again and says, Boom. so it's kind of important, you know, and he did that in six as well, where he, he hammered it down a couple of times, you know, your God sees everything. And now he hammers it in again, so we like to pay attention. Oh, okay, this is real. This is, I mean, obviously it's real, but this is important. We need, to, we need to get this. So how do you treat people? Love them, respect them, care about them, listen to them. All right, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide, for many choose the way. 
but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only few ever find it. Whew. I like how it's very, very clear. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate and that narrow gate is who? There we go. There's only one way through that gate. He is the doorway. I don't care what anybody's told you. There's one way, and his name is Jesus. No other way. And that way is narrow, right? And to me, when I was a kid, I was like, narrow, that sounds tough. The more, more time you spend with him, it's, that narrow road doesn't seem so narrow anymore. It seems as wide as this room because I know what I want to do, and I know what's waiting for me. And it's an easy choice. It doesn't mean there's not struggles, but I know where I'm looking, and I'm looking ahead, I'm not looking here, because I'm to be there. I'm seated in heavenly places. So why would I focus on all the other junk? It's like the world pulls you away. This is easy. There's five lanes, six lanes. Oh, you don't want to worry about traffic? Seven lanes. What do you want them to be? 20 lanes? Come on, whatever you need. The world's going to make it really easy for you. Just like we are talking about with the phone. It's so, like, what does your, your eye gate see? It makes it so easy to go this way and this way and that way. And that's why the road seems narrow to some people. I think that's why he says, the road's narrow. Because there's a specific path you have to go on. And some people think, well, then I'm not going to have any fun. Pfft. Yeah, right. I've, I've been there. And that's like a, a number one key when somebody gives up somebody. Is they're worried about if they're, how they're going to have fun. <laughs> There's way more fun on the narrow road. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. The, the wide road is confusing. You have to look out, like merging traffic and all this stuff. You have to worry if that person's paying attention. Are they texting? Like you drive down the interstate now and you look at people and half of them, they're looking down and still doing this thing. It's like, come on. I mean, I'm guilty of it too, so I can't be talking crap. My phone's like right here. It's not right here, so it's better because I got perif, right? I can see what's going on. It's not better. So sometimes you feel like you're struggling. Maybe it's because you're just on the wide road, you know? God, help me be on that narrow road. Narrow my path. God, I have 10 lanes here. Bring it down to five. Help me see where those other lanes are. Help me narrow it down, God. I want to be on the narrow path because that's where you need me to be. So if you don't feel like you're on a narrow path, have that conversation with God. God, what path am I on? Am I on a wide path right now? Because I feel like I am. God, am I on a narrow path right now? I know I am. You're going to know if you're on that narrow path. And trust me, God is going to come alongside you and help you get to that narrow path because he's not a guy who's upstairs who's just mad at you and saying, how could you? Are again, struggling again on the wide road, Jesse? Come on. Puts you back on the narrow road. No, he's like, Come on, I love you. You see my face? Okay, come on. It's this way again. Jesse, again? Again, this way, yes. I don't, I don't mind. I love you. Let's go. That's the kind of dad he is. He's not the kind of dad that says, are you kidding me? Again? Some of us feel that way. That we've been running for so long that we can't turn and face him. It's just, that's that shame taking hold of you. Doesn't have a place in the kingdom. Doesn't have a place on that narrow road. Yeah, there's a sign that says, no shame. <laughs> shame can't pass here. All right. The tree and its fruit. Let's move on. I'm actually cruising pretty good. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. I love how Jesus like didn't leave any like mystery to what fruit was. You know, the fruit by the way they act. <laughs> like, thank you. That's easy. I love it. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush? Can you guys pick grapes from a thorn bush? No, he can't. Or figs from thistles? Pre- preposterous. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. Huh. That's not really mind-blowing, is it? Bad tree, bad fruit. Good tree, good fruit. 
A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Woo. I've this is this is a scary place right here. <laughs> because in a lot of places there are people who are church hurt and the church has hurt these people because there've been people that have been put in position to hurt people, right? Um, I don't even want to give all the examples of like how it could happen, but there's, there's people that have been hurt. And I, like I said before, I run into people who are hurt by the church and, you know, I don't like church. You know, they, all they did was judge me. said, I didn't give enough money and said, I said, I should quit watching this movie and all this kind of stuff. Like some of these things are true. Yeah. But how are you being approached by that? Are you, are you being savagely attacked for what you do? Or you have somebody that understands you and can come alongside you and help you get that speck out of your eye? And there's people that will, will praise God on Sunday and then Monday through Friday just be the, the biggest jerk you could ever meet. And, you know, there's some people out there that have like, two separate lives where they preach on Sunday and their friends and coworkers don't even know that they love Jesus. And, um, you know, and there's, there's some ministries out there who are, are doing uh, good things, you know, they're, they're ministering to people, people are getting saved, but then there's, there's just no lasting fruit because the character just isn't there, you know? They're talking out one side of their mouth on Sunday and uh, talking out the other on Monday through Friday. I don't know why I'm leaving out Saturday, but maybe even Saturday too. So you really got to, is somebody the same person they are on Sunday as they are on Tuesday, you know? And, you know, I can, I, I struggle with that too when I go out into the world and I, I work and I stuff like that. Like there's real stuff that, that takes a hold of your life. And there's real things that God's telling you to get a hold of, you know. Do you fly off the handle and just get mad all of a sudden? Or do you, are you calm and you, you, you think about it and you say, God, how do I handle this situation? Or when somebody comes up to gossip and slander, do you just put your arm down and say, yeah, come on, bring it on, let's hear it. And then, do you know what I heard? And go on to the next person. Like, is that the kind of people we are, you know? Or we need to be the same person we are in the prayer closet as we are in the streets, you know? All right, 21, true disciples. When I, I remember when I first uh, started reading through these, it was like, it really, it really scared me and it really kind of wrecked me a little bit. Um, but it says... Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Whew. I do not want to be one of them people. You guys do not want to be one of them people. Can you imagine getting there and the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords says, get away from me. I didn't even know you. But Lord, I prayed for people. Don't you know when I, when I, when I prayed for that person, you told me everything about their life and I did it? I said, get away from me. I don't know you. Ugh, isn't that just disgusting, right? I never want to feel that way. And in my notes I have, um, it's possible for a person to exercise a spectacular ministry using the authority and scripture of Jesus' name without walking in genuine obedience and relationship with God. So there's, you know, the, the gifts are without repentance. And like, um, it's just... Just because somebody prays for somebody and they got healed, you know what I'm saying? That you look out for the wolves, you know? And <clears throat> what, I, what I find really cool is God said, get away from me, I didn't even know you. And in the biblical times, the, uh, the word know is like an intimate word. Like, I, I know you. Like, I know God. I know, I know I'm not one of these people, 
Because I know God knows me. You know why? Because I know him. I don't just know about him. I, he's not just a cool guy. I know him personally. I have a personal relationship with him. I speak to him. He speaks to me. We do work together. And just because you prophesy and heal people and minister, get a hold of your heart. Where your, where's your heart? You don't want to be one of these people. I could just tote that forever. It's just so scary that there's people out there that are operating in that. God, we just pray for those people that are operating in that, God, that you would expose it and then, and then help them out. Come alongside them, God, and help them realize the state that they're in. And last but not least, we're going into 24. Building a solid foundation. Church on the rock. <laughs> Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it was built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rain and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And then I think of like Little Red Riding Hood or something, you know, like one of them's brick and one of them's straw. That's not like the way it is. And um, I couldn't imagine showing up to like Steve Osborne's house and being like, Steve, you built your house on sand? Like, it's not a swimming pool, bud. You know what I mean? Like, nobody, it's, it just doesn't make any actual sense. Like, your house is going to fall. Like, even if you have, like, I'm thinking about my stoop at my house, the concrete's falling away, and it still has a footing. You know what I mean? So sometimes our footing can be there, but it's starting to fail, right? <laughs> so in the construction, we call the mud jacker. <laughs> like, is that when like, God comes in and uh, helps you fix your foundation? And that's why I like Church on the Rock, right? Because we're on the rock. That's where our foundation is. Biblically sound on Jesus is where we're founded. And I like it how it's like, well, how do I know if my house is built on sand or rock? Well, he says it right here. Uh, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it, okay, there we go. Isn't he so cool? He doesn't like hide things, right? He was just like, hey, here's this. Keep reading. Seek my face. Okay, revelation. There it is. So if you guys are having a hard time understanding something, dig into the word. Eat the word. Devour it. You know? Do you eat as much time as you, pray, as you read the Bible, you know? Like, are you as hungry for this as you are for food? I don't read my Bible three times a day, so I can't be, like, saying that. But, like, come on, man. He'll fill you. The, to the amount that you're hungry is to the amount that you'll get filled. So if you're not seeing something happen in your life, go after God. What does he say? Seek me. Knock. I will open the door. Run after this thing. God, I'm not seeing this in my life. I'm going after it. I'm attaching myself to it. God, help me be there. How? I'm here. Show me. It's your turn. He will. He'll say, come on. Let's go. Because we're on that narrow road and you need a guide. I'm your man. <laughs> God's so cool, man. Yeah. All right. And when he had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. So this is really cool because he was displaying exactly what he's preaching, you know, pearls to pigs and all that. Narrow gate. He was saying it with such authority. Can you imagine just, whew, I wish they'd make a Netflix series on the actual <laughs> Sermon on the Mount and we could see Jesus as he was and is. Okay, so that was what I had for today. I hope that... Um, we can take some solid stuff out of this and um, apply it to our life. Like I said, this is stuff that's not super mind-blowing and all that kind of stuff. It's just nice basics. Let's get back to it, you know? Sometimes we just get so weighed down with this world that we just forget the simple stuff. Oh, yeah, pearls to pigs. Oh, yeah, narrow road. Oh, yeah, effective prayer. Like, tree and fruit. Like, come on, guys, it's so good. The Bible is so good. Just get into it. Just, just ask him, and if you don't feel excited about the Bible, here's all you have to do. 
make this appointment with God, say, okay, God, at seven o'clock, read my Bible for 10 minutes, and I'm really not entertained when I read, just be honest with him. God, I'm not really entertained when I read this Bible. Entertain me. Show me. You know, like, don't, like, you know what I mean by entertain me, but, like, grab my attention. Grab my heart. I don't feel this. If you don't feel that when you read your Bible, ask God. He will, right? Make this make sense to me. Make this exciting to me. I want this to be exciting to me. Because if you're feeling that, that's a desire that he's placed in your heart, and that's a pulling that he's always been pulling. Spend time with me. Talk with me. Love me. Be with me. He's jealous for you, and he's always running after you. And it's like, um, like when I was a kid, I've I, I shared this story before, but like when I was a kid, I'd, if my mom would lose me, I would always be in, in like a, like if I was in the store, she'd lose me, I'd always be in front of the mirror, like looking at myself and like making funny poses and faces and stuff like that. And uh, God showed me a picture of that's the way the world is right now. We're all about ourselves. We, we, we look good, you know, like I got flowers on my shirt, isn't that cool? Um, but like, we're all about ourselves and in this world, we're too busy always looking at ourselves, and then we just get, we get so bombarded by the world, and we're, God, where are you? And if we would stop making eye contact with ourselves and just look left in the mirror, we can see that he's right behind us, and he has his arms. He's waiting for you to just turn around and hug him. Is life tough? Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your life. Stop looking at the world, and just turn around and look at him. Because he's pursuing you. And he's jealous for your attention. He's a jealous God. Are you loving something in this life more than him? You know? What did I put in front of you, God? And that's why I always say, like, God, any relationship I've put in front of you, show me. Because I want my heart to be abandoned for you. Yeah. I like that one reckless love song, but like, there's always a debate, like, can God be reckless? You know, like, a, like, he's very, very calculated. So, I mean, his love for you seems reckless, but it's not. It's to the world it seems reckless, but he's all in for you. There's nobody in this world that will love you and care about you more than him. And if you have somebody in your life that you feel does that, you're wrong because you're relying on that person more than him. Same with your finances. Everything in your life needs to be tied into him. If I'm praying for somebody, one hand needs to be on the throne and one hand needs to be on them. It never comes from me. It never comes from us. It's everything is from him. And the only thing that flows through us is the faith and obedience and the believing, right? Right? If you love Jesus, tell somebody about it, you know? I love my kids, and I can't stop talking about them. I, like, I love my job and my company, and I can't stop showing people stuff about them. Do I love him enough to, be, to, to share more about him than anything in my life? So if you have something in your life that you're seeking and you're searching and you, you're desperately crying out for, get on your knees, man. Shut the door. Lay on your face until he answers. And if you feel like he hasn't answered, you're just not listening. Think about a whiteboard. Write all your problems. And then before you go in that room with God, say, God, here's all my problems. And now wipe them all away, God. I don't struggle with these things. So if you're struggling with something, bring it to him. Because you're going to continue to struggle with it. I Trust me, you will. And even if you overcome it just a little bit, it'll come back really hard. So if you're struggling with something, say, God, this is not for me. Take it and let him take it. And when he takes it, don't pick it back up. So many times we've put stuff down and picked it back up. And God's just like, I still love him. He's still good. It's like that uh, when it's a candle and the candle gets burned out and there's that red, red wick still and some smoke and he doesn't say, stupid candle, you can never stay lit. He says, oh, there's life in there. And he blows on it. And pretty soon you're on fire again. So if you feel like your candle's been put out or dimmed down, ask God to breathe on it. Because he will. Because he's a good dad who gives good gifts. And there's no better gift to wake up in the morning and be breathing, obviously. But that's when people say, how are you? It's like, woke up breathing. 
I'm good. I got another day to praise the Lord. But there's, there's no better thing when you, when you wake up and he says, good morning. How are you? Simple words, right? Good morning. How are you? But it's everything because he's here. Again, he's here. He's still faithful. And I still need him every day of my life. More than every day. Hour by hour. Second by second. Millisecond by millisecond. Breath by breath. So I'm going to pray. And if anybody needs any prayer, come up. We'll pray for you. Um, during, this, during this song, uh, you guys can think about whatever you want, but when you close your eyes, authentically see his face. I don't know why I need to stress this point, but like, there's so many times that we go into these times and we just still go through the motions, but God's not a God of going through the motions. He's a God of intimacy, of relationship. He's the realest relationship you'll ever have. You can't fake this relationship. So during this time, just see his face and say, God, I love you. I'm going to pray. God, I love you. I worship you. I thank you for who you are and who you've made me to be. I thank you who you've made this church to be, God. I ask you to walk with us. Walk with us hand in hand, foot in foot, God. I ask you to be our guide this week, God, that you bless our conversations, Lord, that you see areas of opportunity in our lives where we can grow in you. God, if we have anything that needs to be put aside, God, help us put it aside. I thank you, God, that when we ask you, will help us with these things, and you, you don't just leave us out and say, that's your problem. God, you saw us pick up this problem, and you knew you'd have to help us through this problem. So I thank you, God, for loving us unconditionally. Without condition, you love us. And I ask you to be with us and speak with us and uh, just become more real to us, God. You're a real God, and sometimes we don't view you as a real thing. We, a real person, we just view you as a guy that's up there, God, but that's not who you are. Skin to skin, bone to bone. Thank you for giving us this access to you, Jesus. We worship you, and we love you. Amen.